Hello, my name is Padrigo Tuma, and I am delighted to be here with George McWhorter, whose translation of Homero Arihis's collection, Self-Portrait in the Zone of Silence, published by New Directions, has been awarded the 2024 Griffin Poetry Prize. George, congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> what an extraordinary um, achievement and um, commendation of, of your work in service of poetry and, and your work as a poet and translator. Um, I am I'm fascinated to interview you because I am um, right now in Belfast, where I live half the time, and I'm just a few minutes away from where it was that you grew up. And so I'd love you to describe um, the Belfast that you grew up in. Oh, the Belfast I grew up in was immediately after the Second World War. So when I came up to Belfast and moved into our house in Northumberland Street. We came from Carnalee, which is a small place on the Belfast Lock. Um, everything smelt of smoke because Belfast, as you know, had been through the Blitz because of Harland and Wolf shipyard. And that's where most of my family worked in Harland and Wolf's. So when I came back five years old and uh, I'd been used to greenery, to hens and chickens out the back and all the rest of it, and at our bungalow in Carnley, which had quite a bit of land, and came back to a kitchen house, which is, you know, is one room in the front, a scullery in the back, two rooms upstairs. And going up the stairs, the smell of smoke to my wee room it was awful. And the reason for that was a bomb had landed in the courtyard behind because the houses were built in squares with a courtyard in the middle. And a bomb had landed right in the middle. And what they had done was pile all the bricks from the backyard walls, which saved a lot of the houses because they were heavy brick backyard walls. So they just piled them up into a heap. It never left. It was just a heap outside my back window. Thank God we went to Cardley frequently. Yeah. From Easter on, we practically lived there again. That's a metaphor. Um, how many were in your family, George? Ah, uh, God. <laughs> well, immediate family, there was my sister, and my half-brother, Ernie Dewey. He was, his father was killed in the First World War. And my father, he fought in the First World War as well. So, but my sister was my father's daughter. So, and uh, so there were, immediately there were three of us. But my mother was a McConnell. And the McConnells were numerous. And my, as my wife found out, my grandfather McConnell was a mattress maker, which he made great use of. And there were yeah. 13 kids, 10 of them survived. There were, I think, there were three girls and the rest were boys. And they were all singers and dancers. And it, during the war, the Second World War, uh, I mentioned Carnley. There were two bungalows with a lot of land. One was belonged to my uncle uh, Huey McConnell, and ours uh, sat right side by side. And half the family McConnell and uh, the married McConnell women, my aunt Mary married a steed, and they lived with us. The other half lived. Uh, with my uncle Huey. So all of the, the McConnells selected uh, with the few uh, McWhorters and Deweys that there were. And uh, at one point, uh, God, there were four bedrooms, luckily, in the bungalow, and they were full. And what wasn't in the bedrooms was on the floor in the sitting room and the living room. <laughs> Whoever was youngest. 
Yeah. You were given a book of Spanish poetry in in your final years in high school in Belfast. And you describe um, how, how that captured your imagination. Could you tell us a bit about that? Oh, the, that was the Oxford, the, it was a newly uh, put out Oxford book of Spanish verse. And uh, it was handed to us as part of the curriculum. And uh, we had a, uh, I had a teacher called uh, Mr. Brown, but we all called him Thunder Brown because he was a small <laughs> man with a barrel chest and a big voice. And um, he was also in the territorial army. And he would come in sometimes with a part of his uniform on. And okay. anyway, there's um, a reminder. <laughs> Mr. Brown would uh, basically, he didn't really know much about poetry. I was doing uh, English poetry uh, at the same time. And I think the uh, most recent poet that we had there was Eliot. But the Oxford book of Spanish verse went from the very beginnings with the anonymous poetry up to people like Lorca, Rafael Alberti, and Juan Ramon Jimenez, and all those guys. And so in one way, it was great that I had that, but Mr. Brown would just hand us a poem to translate for tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Which wow. I'd go off and do. And uh, one of the first poems that I remember was Romance del uh, Moro que perdió a lama. That's the Alhambra. Okay. And I remember doing that. And years later, I've translated that, rhymed it, and this kind of thing, and written. Uh, Poems basically in response, uh, setting in modern day uh, Granada and the Alhambra and all that sweep that goes down that hilly road to the coast. So um, that uh, connected years later. But uh, oh, the useful thing about the Oxford book and all of the modern uh, set supports, including the Latin American ones, Ruben Dario and so on, and Ramon Lopez Velarde, the Mexican. The poets I translated were also fed the same poetry in school. Mm. So this was very handy for me and Jose Emilio Pacheco and Omero and Gabriel Zaid, who I also translate. Yeah. Um, did you ever get in touch with Thunder Brown to tell him that you've continued on the work of translation? <laughs> did I ever? No, no, I didn't, because basically, first of all, we left Ireland for Spain, and then we left Spain for uh, British Columbia, and uh, it's at the far end of the world, so you, you spend so yeah. much time adjusting to being here, having kids and all the rest of it, that I'm sure yeah. by that time... Thunder was long gone. <laughs> wow. I'm sure his memory is around in people, though. That's, that's quite a <laughs> oh, sure. character you, you, you portray of him. I was curious, you know, reading that you had been doing translation in school in Belfast and then moved to Spain. And I think when you were 27, ended up in Canada and British Columbia. Did you need to translate yourself along the way, too? Because um, Belfast for so long has been such a particular complication. Um, did you find translation not just as a skill of literature, but a skill of life as well? Oh, that's my first translation was, as I said, from Carnley to Belfast. And as you know, the, country the, to the, accent, city, yeah. the dialect is quite thick and you have to learn all uh, that vocabulary. In fact, basically, my mother, um, she was illiterate. Uh, loved great jawbreaker words. That jawbreaker is a big word. That'll break mm. your jaw if you, if you have to pronounce it. But uh, she was quite illiterate. And 
the language uh, that we spoke in Belfast in the street had nothing at all to do with anything I read. I mean, mm. my spelling was awful. Still is probably awful because a certain thing in me goes back to root and with sure. words and they come up with the sounds that they had, not the sounds that I learned. And so that was my first translation. Then when I uh, came over to uh, Canada and my wife has a very neutral, lovely telephone voice. She's uh, She could work for the BBC, CBC, any, anybody like that. But my voice, no, it wasn't. And when I was teaching school in Port Alberni, which is on Vancouver Island, uh, they would kind of look at me. <laughs> and I would be using words like, uh, you get me annoyed. And they, they really didn't know what words like annoyed, really, the way I pronounced it, meant. So uh, they used the word hostile. I'm feeling <laughs> hostile. And not that I'm annoyed, I'm feeling hostile. So I had to modify my accent slowly. It took years, actually, it took years and years to, to modify my voice. My reading voice was always better and my speaking voice, because it worked on impulse, right? As we always do. We respond of course. immediately with our speaking voice. But my reading voice was always modulated. And yeah. which is kind of, so I had to get my speaking voice together with my reading voice. And mm -hmm. by this time, as you notice, I've sort of got the two together. You do, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Can hear it coming together. It's, uh, um, yeah, but lifting was, uh, oh boy, uh, such a different world uh, that we came to in BC from, say, uh, Belfast, even Bangor, where I taught school, or the Mourns, I taught school in Kilkeel. Uh, and they had quite a, they would tend to shout, look, like this, oh. And they, they had a fierce accent. The, our landlady used to sh shout at us when we went to deliver the rent. <clears throat> she lived in a cottage, and she would yell at us, Oh, it's the mistress and the master. <laughs> I mean, translation is about translating meaning, but it's also about translating feeling and experience as well. Um, did you find that moving from the country to the city and then learning Spanish and then moving to Spain and then moving to Canada, did you find that you had to develop the skill of kind of translating life experience, not just in language, but but oh, in, a, uh, but in uh, uh, communicating absolutely. who you were as well? Absolutely. I had to uh, learn to put in words what was going on. Basically, I try to... Uh, capture in words things and you can in words capture things live and that's one and to bring back to life that's always been something i've i tried to do i worked at uh doing and bringing things back to a second life in words and uh so uh in Spain, I wrote a couple of poems and about uh, one particular poem that stemmed from a, an Andalusian laborer uh, who was a member of the family in the first big apartment that we rented a room in. And he was down the hall in another room and he was basically dying of consumption. And so I... One of the first poems I wrote in Spain was about him. And uh, then he became a whole set of poems and a character in my first book when I came to British Columbia and went over 
to UBC and started writing seriously. And I wrote this book, basically a memory of what my experience, my life experience, and what I observed and lived with in Barcelona. It became Catalan poems. Yeah. I, I can hear that what you're reaching for through the skill and the complexity of translation, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your approach to that, but that what you're reaching for is that the language sounds alive in the language into which it's, which it's being rendered. It has the cadence. Is it is it a cadence of everyday speech or a cadence of music or emotion or truth? What 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 makes the register seem alive? Oh, it's um, basically uh, the sound is the substance as far as I'm concerned. The sound of the words is the same as the substance in the words. The words are the things, and they're also the actions. So the word for the action and the action and the word are the, essentially the same to me. And um, the rhythm of action, the rhythm uh, that living things have. Uh, this is something uh, I share very much with Omero. And the poets have translated, like Jose Emilio Pacheco, uh, they are very much uh, attached to the life around them, particularly Omero. And so when I'm translating Omero, I try to get the movement, the action. And in some cases with his poems, they're like scenarios. There is action, there is a character. Yeah. And they're, they're doing they're dramatic. Things. It's like, and like a small movie. And their movement has rhythm, right? Mm. In the, the way he basically transcribes it uh, into words. So I try to capture and uh, recreate that. Uh, sometimes um, I'll give you an example of a poem that, uh, well, there's rhythm, but uh, he also is very committed to the environment and many, many things. And he has a poem, uh, it's a strange poem. It's uh, called Elio Antonio de Nebrija, Grammarian at War. And this uh, was the person who created the first Spanish dictionary. And his aim was to civilize the barbaric Spaniards through grammar. And Umero, he kind of wants to do that through poetry. And uh, now, in this poem about Elio Antonio de Nebrija, uh, there is a part where there's a de declaration about what should appear first and foremost in a poem and in sight. And I'll quote you what uh, I said about this. Uh, one of his most resonant declarations, which could be regarded as Umero's own in this poem, is this. And there's a mini list of requisites. The barbarism of the sciences had to be battled with the weapon of grammar which must be put with the verdure and vision in the window front next to verity and the verb. <laughs> uh, took me a lot. He had four Vs 
-hmm. And I, first, I couldn't get the four Vs. And they said, could you not do the four Vs? So I did the four Vs, which has a kind of rhythm to it. It's a declaration, mm -hmm. but it's got rhythm. And, and so much music in it, too. Yeah. You met Homero Arihis when you were translating him as one of 10 poets who was um, part, 10 Spanish writing poets who were uh, in an anthology of poetry that was being released. That's, that's and right. And struck up a connection that stayed there. Oh, that's very one there. It's this one here. It's called, <coughs> or words like monarchs fly. Mm -hmm. and, and like you, you've had a collaboration of over 25 years now. Yeah, a long, long time. It started when I was going down to Mexico City and I would go to Liberia, Peru, and an old place in behind a cathedral that had a great, oh God, warehouse of books, poetry mm -hmm. books. And I would go and collect books and poets and tried because there's so many I mean, it was impossible i started to whittle it down and uh, and one of the helps that i suppose i had i already had been translating jose emilio pacheco and his selected uh, poems had come out with um new directions and uh, i had a connection with new directions with uh, james lachlan his family originally, which is Lachlan Steel, which is et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but his family came from Warren Point. Okay. Halfway between Dublin and Belfast. Halfway between Dublin and Belfast. So we, we had a, a great connection. But uh, I had done uh, Jose Emilio's, and Jose Emilio said, oh, go and try other poets. And so that's exactly what I did. I started collecting uh, all these poets. Now, Jose Emilio had worked with Homero and Ali Chumacero and Octavio Paz on a very important anthology called uh, Poesia in Movimiento, uh, which was the first really big uh, anthology of bringing Mexican poetry up to date. Uh, for the public. So anyway, there was Omero. So I thought, I got to go and see Omero. And that sort of uh, was the, that was the first cue. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I went and met up with him. Mm -hmm. You you collaborate with Omero Arias for so long now. Does it ever feel like co-writing rather than only translation? Uh, not really because um how can i say it's it's just like uh in one way i get cues from omero uh just like that those four v's can you not do the four v's so uh, <laughs> how can i say i get prompt i get uh and i get, there are experiences that only Omero knows they're part of his life. I haven't lived his life, so I have to be told that this yeah. is this is what I'm writing about, uh, or this. Um, no, that it's not that thing. It's this thing. Uh, in one case, there is a poem called El Caracol, which is uh, a snail shell, but. It's also an observatory at Chichen Itza. And uh, the whole, I've mentioned scenario, whole scenario takes place there with a priest. Uh, there is an observer who comes in, and I presume that's a burrow, but he watches this old priest uh, go through with his uh, esquintly, uh, Zoro esquintly dog uh, through this inside of this. Uh, observatory El Caracol and uh, then he's outside and then he's going up uh, he's clambering up a, a, a grassy slope and heading off into a another world from his old world but 
basically, I need to be told quite simply, no, it's not a city of shell, it's the tits and eats it. Mm. Oh, God, yes. So yeah. you've got your kind of simple mind that first impulse got a call, oh, steel shell. Oh, you know, yeah. if you do your dictionary bounce from one language to the other, uh, in the dictionary bounce, you, you immediately see, you're saying, how could all, yeah. how could all be happening inside a steel shell? <laughs> <laughs> and then you're um, even in what she's just said there, though, when you talk about the observer coming into this observatory, the observer observing the priest in this observatory, um, you say you presume that that might be Homero. There is a way within which um, the, the poems that have won the Griffin Prize, that your, your translation of Homero or Rehis's poetry, um, you have to sit with a lot of wonder and mystery. Of course, you can um, ask certain particulars but there's also a, a level of something like wonder, something like guesswork, something like mystery between you and the, the source of the poem. Um, what does that do to, to your writing? Does it guide it? Does it expand it or, or something else? Uh, it uh, basically, it, it, it uh, how can I say, moves me when I, the mystery is that it moves me to where the poem uh, is taking place or to uh, seeing the and hearing the uh, person that whose voice that Omar assumes. One of the, uh, uh, it's because I come from Belfast, that one of the poems that I really like is the epi epitaph for Lupi Berleth, uh, who's a table dancer. And it it's in her voice. It's her talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, the, as just as Obero assumes her voice, then I get assumed into that voice yeah. too. And mm -hmm. I try my best uh, to make it as blunt as she is, as Obero has made it, as she made it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like both of you, therefore, are, are being faithful to a poetic muse that's visiting first through Omero's poem and then to you through the poem, but possibly neither of you are in full control. You're, you're each giving some kind of attention to, to the source of the art, which is bigger than any one particular artist. Well, uh, things take you over, uh, mm. catch your attention, and they grab you. You can't, mm. uh, and then you can't get away from it. And then you, yeah. you have to, you're, 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 you're plagued by these things. You're pursued by these things. All of these little, little this, little that. And um, you have to sort of uh, get it done, get it get it out yeah. to see why did that why did that get a hold of me i i, I know yeah those are very strong words you just used though george plagued and pursued by these things those are very very active verbs <laughs> how <laughs> interesting it doesn't sound it doesn't sound gentle it, it sounds oh, like it's, there's no, something not. that it, gets inside it's, you it's a it's a it's a constant festering as you might say <laughs> <laughs> this gets better and better <laughs> Festering, plagued, and pursued. Um, are you are you and Homero friends now? And I suppose I have a supplementary question before you answer that one, which is: Does it make it easier or more complex to translate a friend? Uh, it's um, it's I. No, I have years and years and years of teaching uh, in a creative writing department, and I never really dealt with the person who had written the poem. I wasn't addressing them. I only addressed the page. It all came to me off the page and what I had to say all related to how what was on the page was working and whether it was faithful to itself or not. And uh, 
whether uh, so I was very much used to it would matter uh, in one way to me because of all those years there's a huge number of years right 30 35 years of this uh, and responding uh, to what uh, what I put on a page and uh, working out how to deal with it, right? Uh, that would be of some value to them. And so I, they could be living all kinds of things in lives and they would want to tell you and et cetera, et cetera. No, I didn't want, <laughs> uh, I only wanted to hear about what affected uh, what was on on the, sure. on the page. Yeah. You have um, won the Griffin Prize for translating a book titled Self-Portrait in the Zone of Silence. And you're translating somebody else's self-portraits um, through language that, that you're being guided into through by skill as well as intuition. What did you discover about yourself through translating this particular collection of Homero Arrhenius? Uh, I discovered more and uh, more uh, affinities with him. There are lots of correspondences uh, mm. between Omero uh, and uh, myself. Omero had an experience when he was young. He was pulled about with a uh, gun and going, trying to shoot uh, either a bird or an animal and ended up shooting himself. And that was a primary uh, epiphany for him that really introduced, taught him, showed him, blasted it into his body, the value of life, right? And um, how can I say, I had an epiphany in Albert Street on a waterworks bus. Uh, Changed my, changed my head. <laughs> God help me, out of waterworks bus at the top. I was going around the curve of uh, Albert Street. The lights run themselves around my head, and I thought like the thorns on the head of the crucified Christ. Right? Says I. I used to be quite religious, anyway. So everything went. I woke up the next morning in my bed and I had started to think actually in images. It was very, very strange. Mm, uh, interesting. I'd, I'd, so he had an epiphany. I had an epiphany, uh, mm. which um, at the same time, there are things about his father, for example, uh, uh, fought in the Greco-Turkish War. He was a captain, and he went through that whole terrible thing with Smyrna. Omero has even got a book called Smyrna in Flames. Uh, my father was in the First World War. Mm. He was one of the famous Ulster volunteers. And then, uh, how can I say, that my, after, after all over, what would my father say about it to me? He said, oh, and this is a phrase they must have used over and over again. He said, there we were. We signed up in blood to fight the English. And we ended up fighting Jerry, with whom we had no quarrel. <laughs> so both parents had been yeah. in wars. His yeah. father, when he came to Mexico, when he uh, was driven uh, to Mexico, and to Contepec, which is Omero's hometown, and in Michoacan, uh, he had a store and sold all kinds of things, clothing. And he would also go around with a mule around Michoacan, selling from the back of the mule. Now, strangely enough, my parents had a fruit and vegetable store on Northumberland Street, in what later became Hetty Garvin's pub, straight across the street from where our little kitchen house was. 
And my father was sent by my mother, because she was the driver. Uh, she sent him down uh, to, with, at first it was a donkey and a cart, and then it became uh, uh, a, a horse later uh, called Tommy. But anyway, my father, in order to get sort of some distance from my mother, he would go down the falls. And that would drive her crazy, selling fruit down the fruit and vegetables down the falls. And my father's very gregarious. And he, of course, he would, people would know him, meet him, talk to him. He would go in and my mother would say, there he was, down the falls, letting his fags off of the Handles on there in a sacred heart. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel the need to do with a translation in the sense of that the area where you're from is a fairly British Protestant area of Belfast. And he would take the cart down to a fairly Irish Catholic area of Belfast, which I mean, they're only a few streets apart. But I mean, it's it's the very area where throughout the latest explosion of the troubles from the 60s to the 90s. Yeah. Terrible things happened. And there and was your father selling vegetables and being gregarious with everyone. <laughs> anyway, you, Omera's the, father would go into, into the hills, kind of, and it was <laughs> dangerous enough. So, <laughs> and he writes about that uh, store. Uh, he writes about basically everything. And the great thing about Omero is he writes about uh, Life in Mexico. It's it's not some be, some poets could be what they write about could be the on the moon, and in May, in Omero's case, it's definitely Mexico, and yeah. and I'm basically the same. Second book I wrote was about the Belfast shipyard. Uh, yeah. I just said of uh, uh, ships that they were building for the P and O line. Uh, yeah. They called them the Rinas. Las Reinas, the Re Reina del Mar, Re Reina del Pacifico. And uh, I wrote a whole book yeah. about the shipyard. It's uh, there's such a strong connection then between these self portraits that somehow they, there's there's something like the effect of a mirror or a window through which yeah. you can see something of his life and yours and the, the, the parents and, the, and the, the working lives of your parents he you grew up with. You've said, George, that silence is the controlling element of sound. Um, you said that years ago in an interview, and then you, you won this prize for a book titled Self-Portrait in the Zone of Silence. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about, um, about, the, spa about this, the, the space of silence in your life and in your work. What is it about silence that seems to, to draw you? Oh. The paradox about silence is that in the silence you hear everything. Mm. It's you need silence to hear things, <laughs> especially in your head. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's very very it's very very important, and put the punctuation. Uh, there's two kinds of punctuation. Uh, Olson and those guys, they they brought uh, breath, and uh, other people bring silence as a great puncture. You know the space between uh, saying this and then saying the next thing is is the great punctuator, and uh, in many ways, that's 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 it. When um, if we were still writing really good lines that could stand on their own, I keep yeah. saying that they're like stages. You could walk mm. across the line, stop, and mm. then hit the next line. It's uh, it's it's like a stage, and then you, you go to yeah. the next scene on the next line, and so on. Yeah. Uh, but there is a space between that, and and there is a kind of uh, silence and mm. the well, it was the hardest thing for me uh, to reach because in Belfast as you know we speak like machine guns <laughs> <laughs> oh my god what a simile <laughs> yeah, yeah, we go. yeah. And, 
uh, a sentence is really like one word sometimes. It's it's said yeah, so fast, uh, mm. and some of yeah. the really good stuff gets gets missed. So it took me a long time to be able to use the silence between what I say now and what I say next. Yeah. But I, I read also in the way that you talk about your poetry and the way you talk about poetry in general, because you've taught creative writing for so many years and have been such an, uh, a support and an influence on so many poets. Um, I, I've read that you say you want poetry to wake people up rather than put them to sleep. You don't want poetry to be soothing. You want it to, to okay. enliven. Um, yeah. And, and does, does silence help that? Does silence help that? Uh, you can scare people with the silence. <laughs> you can you can run uh, a set of action, and and that's what I say. That like the end of a good line, the silence. Yeah, and they they'll go, and the head will go, back, go back along the line. Uh, yeah, it'll it's a way of startling. Yeah. When you translate to create a particular kind of atmosphere of silence for yourself or a particular work environment, or have you ended up translating, especially this particular book, did you translate it in all kinds of environments? I write, translate uh, in all kinds of environments because a lot of it I memorize oh. and I carry it in my head. Now, I, that started when I first came uh, to Vancouver from uh, Vancouver Island and uh, was at UBC and our daughter was small and I was carrying her on my back because we had to share you know time with the kids um, and Angela my wife would be doing courses uh, at UBC as well and um, so I got used carrying Grania, my daughter, uh, on my back and memorizing what I had just left off and then working it in my head as, as I went around with her. Yeah. yeah. So, and I've done that ever since. Beautiful. Yeah. And you picked that up um, by parenting. It wasn't through um, Thunder Brown. That made you I wasn't saying something wrong, no. It was through. He sounds like a man who'd make you memorize things. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Character in a book, yeah. Yeah, thunder arrives. <laughs> I think my last question for you, George, is is to put your own poetics and your own writing. Um, how has being um, a translator and being such an award winning translator? influence the way that you write yourself? Do you find yourself translating and working with multiple possible languages for your own poetry as well? No, basically, I, uh, in my own poetry, I stick pretty well to the, how can I say, the English that I've, uh, how can I say, uh, managed to get some control of. Uh, <laughs> it's very humbly said but but less so about the formal language does as you're thinking about the words you think about the possibilities of plural words do you find yourself thinking as a translator as well as a poet or do you, does the translator energy come in in a, in a very different way and or maybe that's put to the side when you're writing your own work oh I, words uh, a word will come and the spanish for the word will also be there and for no reason, a Spanish word will come into my head uh, or it'll be something I'm looking at and a Spanish word for it will uh, spring up. And so when I'm when I'm writing, I'm not uh, I can uh, I've written four books about a place called Cuauhtla in uh, south of Mexico City in the state of Morelos where we lived. And uh, when I write about that, uh, I kind of listen to uh, those quote lenses, the, 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 
the people of Kwilatla. And uh, I write about them. And uh, so, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, Spanish that they've said, sus dichos y disparachos, their sayings, uh, come, come, th come through my head. And so, uh, and in some way, it'll influence the kinds of sayings that I grew up with, because a lot of them are very similar. So, uh, I, I love stringing a say, a variation of a saying through. So I do, I, I do that. From Belfast to Mexico City. From Belfast to Mexico to Quotla. From Cardali to oh. Quotla. Uh, <laughs> there you are. It, so you've got the alliteration uh, continuing. Uh, <laughs> and my last very, very short question, George, is um, when it comes to the Spanish that you learned when you were living in Belfast and the Spanish that you operate with now, has it moved from kind of European Spain Spanish to Mexican Spanish in terms of the Spanish that you speak and operate in now? Um, like, um, in, a, in a certain way, I still use the the. the. Okay. I still use the. Uh, Do you the, still have that Sp uh, Spanish Spain accent? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I still have that. And if anybody had heard me as one of my former students, uh, who's uh, in uh, in Colorado, he, he said, "Oh, he used to the you used to see you didn't use that say say say." <laughs> And mm -hmm. said yes. Yeah, I was curious. I, I can't mm -hmm. help it. I can't get my uh, my hello uh, when in Barcelona it was say say. No, okay. say say. Mm -hmm. yeah, and there it, are so many Spanishes. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's there's mm -hmm. the, the and, and, and so many Englishes also, like we started off discussing. But you're attentive to the music of all that too when it comes to considering oh. what that might render itself into English. Oh, I, I, I think sometimes I'm driven by a lambeg drum. Oh, wow! It's it's wow. and I, uh, it's uh, just just like and I, I think when uh, Louis McNeese wrote um, that form of his, uh, it's no to the this and it's no to the that. It was. Uh, Full of that lamb bag, bagpipe music. Yeah, wasn't actually. Yeah, it wasn't as much that bagpipe music as the bloody lamb bag drum. Yeah, I mean lamb bag drum has sometimes been called a war drum, um, and bagpipes used to be called war pipes as well. So again, I can hear. I mean, back to that bomb that was in the back of the house in Belfast when you moved there when you were five, and also what it is that pursues and plagues you when you translate. That there is a. There's power and driving force that drives you into silence to listen to the work. Yeah. It's... George McWhorter, um, you have won the 2024 Griffin Poetry Prize for your translation of Homero Arrhenius' self-portrait in the Zone of Silence, published by New Directions. Congratulations, and it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Uh, equally so. A great pleasure, indeed.